flying fortresses, the pioneer four-motored bomber in the air since 1935. Steamroller construction, weight about 25 tons, speed better than 300 miles an hour, range 2100 miles. Piped oxygen for the crews and turbo superchargers for the air-cooled engines. The Norden bombsite, a bomb release that drops them out in perfect stack formation. A precision bomber at 30,000 feet and up. A combat plane at any level. The firepower of a dozen or more high-rate 50 caliber machine guns. A bomb load of three and a half tons. But in the early summer of 1942, the big question was dark. The fortresses had raked through the Pacific skies from Luzon to Midway. But could they bomb Europe? Could they fly and deliver and get back in broad daylight against the full fury of the enemy? Some of the experts said no. Not enough gunpowder. Not enough armor. Not enough speed or range or ruggedness. The losses would be too high. Here is a motion picture record of the first all-American flying fortress raid over Europe. The men crowd into the operations hut, under the windsock traditional as the yellow flag of quarantine. This is the briefing, the final how, where, when and why of the raid. I have your attention please, gentlemen. The pilots have all checked their crews. Everybody present and accounted for. For a long time, we've all been working very hard. The work has been grueling. It's produced results, and our standard of performance is very high. The fact is, however, unless that standard of performance remains high on an actual enemy target, all our work is going to go for nothing. Today, we have an enemy target. Gentlemen, this is the real thing. This is the first operational mission we're going on. Now, you've all been issued your maps. You will note that the target is RP-9X-55. You will find that the recognition of the actual target area, if you follow your maps, will not be a matter of very great difficulty. As you come in from the southwest, you pass a range of rather high hills, ending in a knob of rock which sticks up quite a considerable distance. You will note that to the left of the knob as you approach, and not very many miles away is a lake. You progress past that lake and you will pick up the area of the town without very much difficulty. Remember when you approach the town what your indicated altitude is going to be. Remember that you are not to go below that indicated altitude. Now, as you approach the area, you're going to run into rather heavy concentrations of flak. That flak has to be watched for. You've got to deal with it as you've been taught to deal with it. We have a time check for you. Gentlemen, it is coming up on 45. I shall count the five. Forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five. That's all. That's all. Ten men to a ship, the combat team. Ten men blending together like a good jazz band. 
pilot and co-pilot, bombardier, navigator, engineer, radio man, photographer gunner, waist gunner, ball turret gunner, and tail gunner. The ground men pull the chocks and the first plane hauls her nose round into the wind. The others behind her, following each other like a herd of elephants out of a water hole. Fortresses seem to flatten down, gathering way and lift out toward the continent, out toward the enemy. The ground crews watching and hoping, their half of the job done. Now the ship's at operating altitude, squared away on course in formation. Keeping station, each plane helps to cover the others. Together they make one round bristling hedgehog of fire. The pale, glimmering English sun and the English fields checkerboarded below. Americans from Massachusetts, Idaho, and Kentucky. A long, long way from home. The target is Rouen, the railroad yards. They come in from the northeast in tight formation, very high, invisible from the ground and make their bombing run as the All away, the bombardiers shout. group in elements of three for the run home. Mission accomplished. All B-17s return safely. More raids followed. August 19, 1942. B-17s of a Nazi fighter base at Abbeyville in support of Dieppe raid. Airdrome and fuel tanks fired. Buildings raised. Return with full compliments. Mission accomplished. August 21, 1942. 11 B-17s without fighter escort attacked over North Sea by 25 Puck Wolves 190s. Three enemy fighters destroyed. Nine more probably destroyed or damaged. One fortress pilot killed co-pilot wounded. August 27th, September 7th, October 5th, a fortress named Phyllis attacked by 44 wolves, two engines out of commission. A third later failed over the channel. Three shell holes in rudder, three more in stabilizers. Controls partly shot away, landing gear smashed. 200 holes in fuselage, but Phyllis came home. October 10th, more than 500 United Nations planes a hundred or more fortresses bomb locomotive and steel works at Lille. Four bombers fail to return. American bomber crews credited with at least 48 German planes, probably 38 others, damaged to 19 more. 
Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. In the Philippines, at Midway, in New Guinea, in the Solomons, over France, over Germany, over Italy and North Africa, out over the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, the North Sea and the Mediterranean, America's flying fortresses are blasting new patterns of victory.